Good evening. <laughs> Hindi mujhe acha lag kahe. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> okay. Sorry for the longer introduction here. Um, there was a comment uh, or a request um, tonight if um, if I could talk a bit more about my teacher, our teacher, and Bante, and, and I thought I would maybe um, start with that, give a little introduction. And um, I actually last retreat I was able to get a good size picture printed of Bante and could have him on the altar, but uh, this time, no. <laughs> Since tonight is uh, the talk on the levels of meditation, the jhanas, and um, this is uh, basically Bhante Vimal Ramsey's, a, a bit uh, his claim of fame, basically. Um, the Anupada Sutta, Najmanakaya uh, 111, which is a specific sutta. It's not the sutta I will be reading tonight, but uh, his, his discourse that he gave on the, the levels of meditation and the progression of his teaching through each of the states of release up to until Niroda, Nibbana, um, was uh, definitely marked the lives of many people, I think. Uh, so for me, um, as I uh, was on my quest, <laughs> my spiritual quest, and uh, I was going to go ordain in Burma, and um, my meditation was terrible, <laughs> and I was going through a lot of pain and tension in my body, and I was just being told to stay equanimous, and that was really not helpful. <laughs> um, I came to a point in my meditation where I was like, yeah, this is just like, it's always the same. I'm being told the same thing. Don't get attached to the joy and remain equanimous. <laughs> so uh, for me, it, it didn't really work that well. And then so I started seeking for other teachings and teachers and uh, went, uh, opened up the spectrum, basically. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people I've studied uh, from uh, Bhante Gunaratana, Ajahn Brahm, um, Saida Utejniya, uh, I mean Paok Saida's his lineage and uh, all all these all these people, um, and then at some point, a long story short, um, because I was going over uh, all over the place, monasteries and uh, meditation centers, and vipassana goenka and all that. I was long term server. At some point, I was gonna go ordain in Burma. And um, everything was set. My kuti was reserved. I had Pao Xaido's signature on my visa, and uh, my flight ticket was booked. I was just going there. And uh, but my meditation was not really good at all. And so I was still looking out for good, any anything that could help, basically. And uh, one of my friends I had served at a monastery with in uh, southern states in Georgia, uh, she said I should uh, check out Bhante Vimal Ramsey and Twim and his online, free online retreats because uh, her friend had really good experience with it. And so I decided that, yeah, that's, I was going to give it a try. And uh, I started listening to Bhante's talks and all the questions that I had regarding the suttas, uh, because I was really uh, impressed by the Buddha's own words and wisdom, basically, in the suttas, which I started reading. Uh, Bhante was just answering my questions one after the other, and I couldn't believe it. Like, I asked these questions to, like, top Sayadaws and abbots of monasteries from all over uh, Asia and Sayadaws, and, uh, in Pao tradition, and they were really nice people, they w but they were only answering me with commentaries, which basically didn't really answer my question. Uh, it just created more questions. <laughs> so, but Bante seemed to be exactly spot on, answering exactly in the way that I was kind of 
uh, it felt like, oh, this person actually knows what he's talking about. And uh, so it was really uh, interesting. And then I started, I did my first uh, 10 day retreat online. They didn't have a teacher available. So I, I just did it by myself and I just kind of tried, plowed my way through. Uh, and it was the best retreat I'd ever had, even without a teacher. Um, my meditation, monks can't really talk about their, their meditation, but I can just say uh, that it went deeper in, in 10 days than five years. <laughs> and um, everything that I was having a hard time with was kind of lifted and it just like became very obvious that this was the path for me anyways. And so, much of the faith that arose um, for me was this very discourse by Bhante, uh, his discourse on the jhanas, basically. And hearing him uh, saying, talking about these different levels of meditation and his language that he was using that was really um, organic and that was really close to the Buddha's words, the suttas, made a huge, huge difference. Um, and once I heard that talk, I was, uh, I was pretty much sold. I had a lot of like tremendous faith in him. Uh, and I just really, uh, I really liked his, you know, like how solid he was, you know, like his deep voice. And he's just like, just like not moving. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. So he's a, he's a very confident man. And so, um, yeah. For me, uh, that was really um, attractive uh, in a sense of his wisdom was, uh, seemed to be very well established. So I canceled everything and I just decided to go and ordain there uh, in Missouri, which was quite a big decision. Yeah, uh, so this was after an eight month, eight month retreat by myself uh, at my mother's place. I'm from the countryside in uh, rural Quebec, Canada. So it's a very peaceful like house in the fields kind of thing. And it was a really, it was still up to this day, the, the best retreat I've ever had. <laughs> it's kind of weird to say that as a monk, but <laughs> it was. So <laughs> I would just come down and cook for my mom and she would be so happy. And that was like my dana for the day. And uh, cause she doesn't like cooking. <laughs> and so I just did my, my, uh, my good service and that made me happy and it made her happy and uh, the rest of the time. She's a hermit just like me so <laughs> she was just reading her books and I was just meditating for like five hours in the morning upstairs and in my room and same thing in the evening. And then so going to Damasuka uh, with uh, with this experience, which was just like, uh, you know, su such a precious, um, such a precious gift to receive. And I think, uh, and I want to thank you for the, for the question or the request, because it made me think how, how to approach this and uh, what do I actually uh, want to say about, uh, about Bante that is, uh, I was thinking for a bit and I was wondering uh, what's the best thing, what, what did I get out of this and what's like, what could I say about this experience? And I think that all in all, just being there and um, in the end, I think serving him was the most beautiful thing. Um, uh, serving somebody that you truly love and respect is such a beautiful gift. Um, it wasn't always easy every, every day. Um, but uh, the looking back at it, it's uh, just like sweeping his porch and just like preparing his chair for the interviews and putting some water in the Buddha fountain. And he had this little Yoda figurine for those of you who know Star Wars, <laughs> with the lightsaber, and he's just like on top of the Buddha uh, fountain, water fountain, and uh, every time somebody would say, uh, "Okay, Bante, I'll try," because he would say like, "Okay, now I want you to sit 
for four hours <laughs> and don't move. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, Bante, I'll, I'll try. It was like, there's no try. <laughs> and he would point to the Yoda. It was like, <laughs> you do or you don't. <laughs> there's no try. <laughs> So, um, and that would work. <laughs> he, he just had this way of doing things. He, he had quite this, quite this presence about him. So, and just being there with him and uh, serving him, you know, uh, I don't know, like uh, clearing all the larvae of the Japanese maple tree in front of my kuti and his kuti. And uh, yeah, just like whatever he was saying, just doing it. And um, yeah, I think there's something really special, you know, like a lot of people in the West, especially, we, um, we have a hard time with like the bowing thing and uh, paying respects. And uh, for me, it's like, I just love it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it brings like such beautiful qualities within us. Um, and uh, when it's done properly, not like, uh, not in a forced way. It's it's such a beautiful thing. It brings up so much love in in our hearts. And the first thing I asked Bante when I was there was to actually pay my respects. And it was such like I'll remember that all my life for sure. Um, with the gift that he gave me, basically this teaching. So we had a pretty strong mental connection. I don't know how that worked, but. I was sitting at the table at one point and uh, we were like eating lunch and uh, I guess that's how it works when you have a lot of love for your teacher or something but um, I'd be like eating in my bowl and uh, I'm thinking like oh I should give some water to Bante and I'm looking up and he's holding his glass like this looking at me <laughs> I'm like oh <laughs> <laughs> and that really actually, uh, that was a really great teaching on uh, non-self. <laughs> I was like, hmm, whose thought was that? <laughs> was that his thought or my thought? <laughs> That's kind of weird. <laughs> but yeah, so it was really interesting, like so many things like that happening and uh, yeah, feeding the goats. That was great. Was there goats when you were there? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, good. Um, yeah, so that's the anthem to my teacher. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I don't want to spread it too long. I just uh, thought I would open with that and uh, put a little bit of context since this is um, Bante's big teaching. Uh, the whole, basically, we give a little bit of the recipe to start with, uh, the, the, the retreat. And then once the momentum starts to pick up and people start to experience really the meditation, this is the talk that we give usually day three or day four because it's, um, it, it requires a certain amount of mental calm and composure. And, and it's like basically I would say the rest of the recipe or the full recipe here so that we can see the whole progression. This is, in fact, the first discourse that I ever gave as well. Uh, Bante, at one point, uh, when I was at Dhammasukha, uh, asked me to give a discourse on uh, the many kinds of feelings. So this is uh, 50, 56, 59, Majjhimanikaya, anyways. At that time, the carpenter Panchakanga went to visit the elder Udai. He approached, paid loving respects, and sat down beside him. Then the carpenter Panchikanga asked the elder Udai, Bhante, how many sensations were explained by the awakened one? And then he replied, the awakened one explained three kinds of sensations, carpenter. Pleasant sensations, unpleasant sensations, and neutral sensations. These are the three kinds of sensations explained by the Awakened One. When this was said, Panchakanga replied, But Bhante Udayi, the teacher did not speak about three kinds of sensations. He spoke 
only about two kinds, pleasant and unpleasant. I don't know about you, but I always wonder, like, why did he ask him? <laughs> if he thought he knew. <laughs> why are you asking? <laughs> Bhante, the awakened one said that neutral sensations are delightful happiness partaking of peace. So that would be upekka that comes through mental development, for those of you who are uh, uh, sutta geeks. <laughs> for a second time, for a third time, the elder Udayi said the same to Panchakanga. But Bhante Udayi, the teacher, did not speak about three kinds of sensations. And never could the elder Udayi's explanation be received by Panchakanga nor could Panchakanga's explanation be received by the elder Udayi. So they did not get along. Overhearing this friendly discussion between the elder Udayi and the, part, the carpenter, the elder Ananda went to the awakened one, sat down beside him, reported this discussion and informed the awakened one. Then the Buddha said, the statement of the elder Udayi, which Panchakanga would not accept, was true. And the statement of Panchakanga, which the elder Udayi would not accept, was also true. <laughs> Ananda, I spoke of two kinds of sensations in one discourse. I spoke of three kinds of sensations in another. I spoke of five kinds of sensations in yet another. I spoke of six kinds of sensations in another. I spoke of 18 kinds of sensations in yet another. I spoke of 36 kinds of sensations in another discourse. And I spoke of 108 kinds of sensations in yet another. I have taught the Dhamma in all these different ways, Ananda. And though I have taught the Dhamma in all these different ways, even if it was well spoken and clearly expressed every time, it is to be expected that some will not approve, some will not concede, and some will not appreciate. These people will be living at strife, disputing and arguing, continually attacking each other with words like swords, that sound familiar? Hmm. <laughs> I have taught the Dhamma in all these different ways, Ananda. When the Dhamma has been taught by me in all these different ways, well spoken and clearly expressed each time, it is to be expected that some will approve, some will concede, and some will appreciate. These people will be living in unity in mutual joy, without dispute, blending together like milk and water, continually looking upon one another with caring eyes. Ananda, there is, there are these five kinds of sensory desires. Forms perceived by the eye, which are desired, loved, seductive and enticing, mingled with desire and exciting. There are sounds perceived by the ears, odors perceived by the nose, flavors perceived by the tongue, and tangibles perceived by the body, which are desired, loved, seductive and enticing, mingled with desire and exciting. These are the five kinds of sensory desires, Ananda. The, the happiness and delight that arises rooted upon these five kinds of sensory desires, this is called the happiness of craving. So there is a certain form of happiness that we can derive from these things. It's not that the Buddha, and in fact in, in some suttas, he, he clearly said that these, these things, especially for lay practitioners, they shouldn't be completely barred out, you know, they, they shouldn't be 
like seen as like evil or anything like that. But just uh, to be careful, just to be careful to not invest all of your happiness into those because it's a poor investment. You never know what can happen with those. You never know tomorrow, maybe uh, if you're a tea drinker, uh, maybe tomorrow you'll wake up, there's not going to be any tea. What are you going to do? <laughs> or maybe um, there's not going to be your favorite meal or whatever it is, uh, the kind of bed that you like or whatever preferences that we have in life. Uh, but just to say that is, is kind of like, it's a bit sad, it's a bit dark. It's like, no, don't do any of this. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so what's my choice, you know? Like, it's like, life, life is miserable? No, it's not. <laughs> no. In fact, uh, the Buddha even said, uh, you know, uh, in, in the lay life, um, to, to actually have uh, an honest living, uh, a live, uh, livelihood, a lifestyle that is, you know, um, uh, honest and good, and then with the, that income uh, to actually give your family uh, what they need, what they, what they want, what they, what they enjoy, is also definitely part of, part of a good happiness. Um, although this sutta is very beautiful because it shows the way to a very different kind of happiness, which can always be there with you and is not shaken by anything in this world. So. Reminds me of a book by Lama Yeshi called uh, When the Chocolate Runs Out. Oh, that's a sad day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of says it all. I mean, the book's about. <laughs> You're pretty happy when you have your chocolate bar, but then how do you get your happiness when it's gone? Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness, and delight that can be experienced. I do not agree with them. Good. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. And what is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, letting go of all sensory engagement, letting go of unwholesome mental states, still attended by thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of letting go. One understands and abides in the first level of meditation. This is that other kind of happiness which is beyond and more exalted. Now, this is really the first level where uh, you've been with your object of meditation, loving kindness, uh, probably your spiritual friend, and it's uh, arising and it's staying there for some time. And not long enough that you feel some joy. The first in the TWIM curriculum, uh, the first thing we look for is joy. Joy arising also with the metta. So that is when we start to see, okay, now they're starting to have a good stream of wholesome states basically arising for them. For meditators. So basically every time you 6R, sensory engagement, you close your eyes, you sit down, you 6R everything, uh, and then you uphold, that is sensory engagement, letting go of that. And then unwholesome states is any distractions, and as long as you're with the metta for, for a little bit, there's no unwholesome states. So that's what that is. So as, as long as the metta is a little bit going on, and then there's the joy of letting go of everything else and the metta, then you're doing good. <laughs> First level. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perceptions become invaded and filled with sensory gratification or sensory engagement. Basically, you're sitting and you're thinking of, I don't know, lunch or whatever it's, whatever it happens to be. And one feels it as a disturbance, because it is. Just as if pain were to arise for one who was happy, that would be known as a disturbance. 
Similarly, when one's awareness and perception becomes invaded and filled with sensory engagement, one feels it as a disturbance. Friend, disturbances have been declared as unpleasant or troublesome by the awakened one. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. So slowly we will make our way. Nibbana is at every step of the way, basically. It's not this big, uh, unattainable uh, state that feels you know, so far out. It is every time we six are. And that was one of the beautiful things that Bhante used to say, is every time you release and you relax, you let go of a distraction, you are experiencing Nibbana here and now, just a little bit. There are different kinds of Nibbana. So first of all, it would depend what, what, what is meant as attaining Nibbana. Because uh, in, in some of the suttas, the Buddha would, uh, somebody, somebody would come to the Buddha and say, directly visible Nibbana, directly visible Nibbana. But what is directly visible Nibbana? And he would say, when one has anger, one lets it go. This is Nibbana, directly visible here and now. He used the word Nibbana because the word Nibbana means to blow out, to extinguish. It means also extinguishing the fire of uh, wanting, craving, uh, uh, aversion, and uh, delusion, basically. So whenever we six R, whenever we apply the six R's, we recognize, release, relax, uh, re-smile, return to the metta, and then repeat that. Every time we release, relax, re-smile, bring up, bring up the metta again, that is Nibbana, mini, mini Nibbana. <laughs> and slowly it gets bigger, gets more. <laughs> and this is actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about this tonight. But, and then some people think that Nibbana means like arahanship, like full awakening. That's, that's just another, it's not, it's not wrong, it's true, but it's just another way of interpreting Nibbana. Uh, yeah. So there is also something that we will talk about at the end of this, this talk, basically this, this chain of levels of meditations and ends up in Niroda Samapati, which is like the cessation of perception and feeling or perception and experience. And this is also synonymous with Nibbana. Uh, but we will see at the end, I will loop with uh, what we recite every morning, and that's why I uh, want to recite this all together every morning, so that this is clear. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness, and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, with the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, one's mind becoming unified without thinking and reflection with the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness. One understands and abides in the th second level of meditation. This is that other kind of happiness which is beyond and more exalted. So at this point, um, this is the first place where the word samadhi, samadhi is used. And so the first level was more like viveka, letting go of everything, letting go of unwholesome states and letting go of sensory engagement. Now, as we do this continually, we let go, we let go, and we cultivate the wholesome. The mind naturally gets collected. And that's what we start to experience here. It's not extremely strong, but we start to feel a sense of mental collectedness, gathering, mental unity.
at this point, remembering or verbalizing or picturing visualization of anything will become a little too coarse. So that needs to calm down as well. And so this is really helpful for us to know because if we hold on to these things, then we are not allowing ourselves to go deeper. So by letting go of each of these perceptions as we go through with wisdom, then we're allowed to go deeper and deeper and deeper and follow basically the recipe. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with thinking and one feels it as a disturbance. Has that happened to you? <laughs> mm, nobody was thinking during their meditation. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know a few people told me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. So, I, so basically, uh, this, this is two suttas that I put together, actually, that I stitched together. Uh, one, the, the sutta that talks about the Nibbana and the, the distraction arising is just a patched in because I really like to have that perception, that perspective where the um, factors from the other jhanas might arise, but they seem actually coarse at that point because they are not going deeper. They're just... Uh, so at that point, the thinking and reflection of the first jhana, when that arises and somebody is in like a deeper place at like the second level of meditation, then one realizes, hmm, yes, this is, this is a little heavy, a little coarse. So like this, gradually, and this is Nibbana, the letting go of this, the, the Nibbana-ing, the coarser perception, basically, blowing out, calming it down. Just as if a pain were to arise for one who was happy, that would be known as a disturbance. That would be right. Friend disturbances have been declared as troublesome by the awakened one. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. So gradually enjoying the bliss of release, calming down. Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, with the calming of stronger joy, abiding in mental steadiness, present and fully aware, experiencing happiness or ease within the body. That state which the awakened ones describe as steady presence of mind. This is a pleasant abiding. One understands and abides in the third level of meditation. This is that other kind of happiness which is beyond this and more exalted. So here what happens is now we had a common factor was a, a bit of a stronger joy in the first two, two levels of meditation which is like the cleansing agent of the mind. So what it does is that it kind of like it cleans the slate and makes it very bright and clear and steady. And at that point, the mind doesn't need as strong of a joy. It's like uh, at the beginning when you, your bathroom is really dirty, you use a lot of really chemical stuff or whatever it is. <laughs> Maybe, hopefully not too much. But <laughs> But, um, and then you scrub for a bit and then you rinse it and then you don't, you don't need that anymore. Uh, the, the coarser uh, defilements or the coarser residues are kind of gone and then you can just like uh, wash with water and it's, it's fine. So this is the, the stronger joy. Like here, a lot of people say, oh, the joy, like it, it vanishes. It doesn't exist anymore, but that's not true. It's uh, actually the, the Pali word for that is vupassama here, and that just means it calms down. So the joy never stops. It just calms down. It matures. It becomes more steady. 
and calm. But it is still very enjoyable, as some of you know. <laughs> and what arises more and more is the bliss of a steady mind, basically. That's what the awakened ones, the, Ari the Aryas, um, describe as that steady presence of mind, basically. And more and more, the mind delights in that. It finds that, that poise, that steady, beautiful, uh, um, collected poise, much better than anything else. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perceptions become invaded and filled with coarser joy or stronger joy. And one feels it as a disturbance. Sometimes, because uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the joy, um, but it's not any kind of joy. It's a tranquil joy. It's a, it's a very still, uh, peaceful joy that we are um, promoting here. It's not like a getting really excited, kind of uh, running around joy. And sometimes, quite rarely, but it does happen that sometimes people uh, get excited, get too excited, and that, and that needs to calm down as well. So it's a very, you know, it's a balancing of the seven supports of awakening. So at this, at this point, when stronger joy arises, it doesn't necessarily feel it feels like um, maybe a little tense at that point, and maybe some of you have noticed that when the mind starts to calm down, and if joy were to remain really strong, it feels a bit tensed. So that naturally the mind will be wanting to release and relax that tension. And that's where the six R's are so important. A lot of people think that uh, this meditation is about loving kindness. Um, it is partly, I would say it is 30% of this meditation is about loving kindness, 25 to 30%. But the mm -hmm. cornerstone of this teaching is the relax step, the release and relax. And that is really what matters the most and what will follow and guide us through the, the right path in this meditation. If we hold on to the loving kindness, uh, we will not allow ourselves to go deeper. And so as we go through these states, the loving kindness also changes. Yes. Just, as a, just as if a pain were to arise for one who, were, who was happy, this would be known as a disturbance. Friend, disturbances have been declared uh, as troublesome by the awakened one. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. So even the stronger joy, see, we're starting to, it calms down. And we find even more delight in this steady poise, this steadiness of mind, Upekka, which reaches full bloom in the fourth jhana, basically. This is just the beginning. Hmm. Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness, and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, unattached to pleasant experiences and unstirred by unpleasant ones, as mental excitement and heaviness settle, one's mind is balanced, purified by unmoving presence. One understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation, accompanied with loving kindness. So, all the way up to the fourth jhana is accompanied with loving kindness. Now, this is in another sutta, this is in another discourse where we find that, but uh, here you just have to have faith in what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, I did give it in another retreat, in a few other, but uh, yeah, it's, we only have so many, uh, so many hours in one day, so 
And this is uh, basically in a sutta where the Buddha says the limit of loving kindness is the beautiful, the subha, and the beautiful is the fourth jhana, which is in another sutta. So this means that if you've noticed, uh, the experience here in the mind and heart is changing and it's slowly calming down and becoming much, much more steady, much more subtle and uh, calm. Is that a yes? <laughs> and so obviously the feeling of loving kindness, the tone of loving kindness, the frequency of the loving kindness will also change. So it is normal. We don't want to hold on to the strong feeling here of loving kindness. And this is a very important part of the recipe, basically, that we've been talking about since the beginning is that we need to allow the mind to release itself. And the loving kindness is a vehicle that we are using to carry us through, to carry our awareness through the levels of release. So the levels of meditation are also levels of release, mental release, basically. And so at this level, the loving kindness becomes very, very subtle. It's still there, but it's very, very faint, but also much easier to sustain. It doesn't require so much energy. I think many people can probably relate to that. Uh, loving kindness can be uh, quite energetically demanding if you just like push it through, like. 100%, 24-7, it's quite demanding. Uh, it's not impossible, but um, the, real, the real practice here is not to do that, it's not to force the loving kindness, to push it. It's to understand it properly with wisdom, with discernment, and understand that it purifies itself as it goes through as it goes through the release process. Also, another thing that we look for is, uh, along the recipe, is as this starts to build, the loving kindness starts to calm down, the mind gets purified, it gets much more steady, and the loving kindness is quite easier to maintain, yet it's quite faint at that point. Don't look for like Venerable was saying, like sometimes it can be strong, sometimes it can be, be uh, more subtle. Actually, more subtle is where it's going. So don't think that this is a bad thing necessarily. And then spending a lot of time uh, with this after usually, usually 45 minutes to an hour sit, uh, in, in terms of like a first retreat kind of thing because um, everybody's a bit different. Then uh, one of the experiences we are looking for is that the body awareness will start to kind of uh, dim down. The mind will stop being really interested in the body. The body is uh, really complicated. <laughs> when you think of it, there's so many sensations, there's the shape is really complex, there's a lot of things going on. And the mind, when it calms down and it becomes collected, that collectedness of mind becomes much, much more blissful than any kind of awareness of the body that we could have. So at this point, we are looking at, okay, now I'll be asking people on interviews, so, do you feel like any part of your body is kind of fading away, you're losing awareness? Uh, people will say, yeah, I'm like, a, I have to check, like, my hand's still there? Or like, my feet? And then, so that's just, a, that's a sign that we're looking for that, okay, the mind is kind of retracting out of uh, bodily awareness. If something uh, like a fly lands on you or like a, the wind is blowing, you'll feel it. You, like the body is not completely gone. It doesn't, didn't disappear. I mean, that would be pretty awesome, but I uh, <laughs> haven't seen that too many times. <laughs> so 
basically but whatever happens if there's a coarser contact on the body don't worry you'll feel it it's gonna be there it's just uh, and if if you were to direct your mind at the body you would feel it you would feel your body but it's just that the mind is and that's the releasing process as you release and relax of all the distractions and the mind becomes very very uh, calm and uh, detached and viveka basically uh, it will just rest here and um, it won't be really interested in the body basically that's all it means so when one abides meditating in this way one's awareness and perceptions become invaded and filled with uh, steadiness or immovability that is just basically the um, uh, the beginning of the the, the poise in the third jhana and one feels it as a disturbance just as a pain were to arise for someone who was happy this would be known as a disturbance and disturbances have been declared as troublesome by the awakened one by this line of reasoning it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness that is beyond this and more exalted. What other kind of happiness is this? Here, Ananda, leaving behind all perceptions of form, that means the body, with the fading away of sensory awareness, all sensory contact, turning away from the perception of plurality, that's the complexity of the body, basically, aware of endless space, one understands and abides in the plane of endless space. So at this point, the mind will be very collected, and this is where we start to ask people if they feel like the loving kindness has gone to the head. It's a kind of a sneaky way to ask, is this happening, basically? And is the mental collectedness basically now um, prevalent? And the metta, since there's not so much of a strong bodily awareness, the metta will feel like it's going outwards from here. And what happens with um, this state in particular is that when there's no more awareness of body, which is really coarse and dense and heavy, we, we leave the realm of, the, of rupa, of the body, and the, into the realm of the mind. So basically the mind will be very collected, but the mind doesn't have a body. Mind is mind. And so the first thing that is experienced is this really vast spaciousness. Some people feel like it's an expansive feeling. Some people feel like it's just a vast expanse of nothing, basically. Um, but this is usually the, the next perception that arises. And that is even more calm, even more detached, relaxed. And when this happens, we usually uh, give instructions. We have a little exercise that we do that is called breaking down the barriers um, that is going through many different people uh, so that we open up the loving kindness. And at this place, uh, loving kindness is not, um, is not really possible anymore. It's a bit too strong. And so it will become a little bit more detached. The loving kindness here changes. It, uh, the, the tone of it changes and it becomes more like compassion. But this is a very subtle form of compassion and um, a lot of people often miss that part. <laughs> so don't worry too much. It's not that important. As long as there's still joy in the six R's, you're still good to go. This is that other kind of happiness which is beyond this and more exalted. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception becomes invaded and filled with the perception of form, with bodily awareness. So it's possible that, you know, some kind of wind starts blowing on you and then it brings your mind back down into the body and really feeling the body and um, 
feeling the mind going back into those sensations. But the mind at this point will know there is better, there is a deeper release, a calmer release. And so it, it will just tend to kind of six are the body again, six are these sensations again, and enjoy the release of the infinite space. By this line of reasoning, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. So slowly, gradually cultivating Nibbana. Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, leaving behind the plane of endless space, aware of endless consciousness, one understands and abides in the plane of endless consciousness. So again, here, the, the meditation keeps changing a little bit. As we get used to the endless space in the mind, now, what will happen is that the mind will also um, become so much um, clearer and released that it will start to, like this, this awareness of vastness is a little too much and it will start to, be, uh, to notice its own behavior. So basically it will start to notice how the mind is arising and passing away, arising and passing away, arising and passing away, arising and passing away. Every nanosecond, uh, a lot of arising and passing away of mind or consciousness. And that's why this plane is called endless consciousness, is because that's the insight of the jhana. You know, a lot of people say that uh, jhana is just jhana, it's samatha, there's no, like, that's not... It's got nothing to do with insight really, but actually each of those jhanas are insights into the mind. That's just what they are. So uh, they are levels of understanding. And so the mind starts to break apart at this point and um, we start to notice arising and passing away very, very quickly of the mind. Some people get to this state and they say like, yeah, but my mind's like really active, like it's more active than before. It's like, yeah, but no. <laughs> it's just because it's getting so subtle and we're not used to that yet because we're, we're just new to this state, but it's getting to that state where it's, it, the mind has gotten so subtle and it's never experienced how the mind is just arising and passing away so much. It's just that it's buried under like even coarser perceptions. We don't get to see that, but at that level, we get to see like a, a bit like a microscope on like, um, I don't know, um, like a, a table surface. And then you could see like all the little bacteria going on, you know, but it's, it's always there, but it's just that <laughs> now you're seeing it because you have a, a calm enough mind. And at this point, the feeling of boundless compassion will also change. And remember that also when the feeling of loving kindness in the fourth jhana goes up to the head, you don't push it back down. Don't try to make it back down into the body. That's where it's going to be from now on. And so that feeling of boundless compassion kind of fades down and the boundless joy is Joy is just more simple. Like their loving kindness and compassion, they come with quite a bit of engagement. They, they have this kind of more like a intense feeling about it. But the feeling of joy is just simple. So it's really easy to just have it there and be like, yay. <laughs> right? That's pretty simple. Compassion can have a little bit of like, yeah, like, oh, poor this person. But joy is just, woohoo. 
So, <laughs> so it's not really not complicated. It's really simple, and it goes deeper. That's why it's that's why it's it, it can be sustained at that point. It's just more simple. So as we go, the simpler, the better. That's what that means. As the mind becomes more and more released, when one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception becomes invaded and filled with awareness of endless spaciousness, and one feels it as a disturbance. So, I also like. Uh, this sutta because it's kind of saying it's not going to be like a clear cut you know choo, now you're in another completely different realm you know and that's there's no way these two realms cross it's not it just doesn't work like that it's going to be at in and out in and out and then gradually as the mind gets more and more used to this then it will stay there and it's going to be more comfortable Sometimes it can go back a little bit and like, oh yeah, right, I remember this. And then come, oh yeah, 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 this is better. Yeah. So this is how it's slowly going to happen. Just as if a pain were to arise to someone who was happy, this would be a disturbance. Disturbances have been declared as troublesome. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood, Nibbana is happiness. So letting go is happiness. Releasing is happiness. Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. Hmm. Okay. Here, Ananda, leaving behind the plane of endless consciousness, aware of nothing in particular, one understands and abides in the plane of bare awareness or nothingness. That is, that other kind of happiness which is beyond and more exalted. So, what happens here? Basically, as the flickering of the mind, because it's also, it also can be seen as a, a movie, like the consciousness can be seen as like a, like a movie projector, like these old uh, frame uh, movie projectors. And then as the mind calms down, then we start to uh, see the still pictures or basically I like the analogy of like, basically it's like taking off the reel and you just have the white light projector, basically. That's the bare awareness there. There is no more of the thinking, but there's still the projection. That's like the pure awareness. And as the mind calms down, it becomes very, very, very still. And this is the beginning of what we call the still mind or quiet mind. At this level, radiating equanimity or boundless calm is also possible. It's still uh, an experience that can be done. Uh, usually the radiance in the mind from, from the joy into the calm will be kind of natural. It will be kind of, the joy will simply calm down and it will melt into, naturally the mind will become so still like that like straight movie projector, that white light, it will be just like very still and it's not really going to move, it's not really going to want to radiate anything anymore. It's going to find a lot more bliss and happiness in that uh, awareness of nothingness basically, nothing in particular. This is why I call it bare awareness is because um, it's the awareness of awareness itself. Basically, there is no picture in front of, of the projector, basically. So this is starting to get really uh, interesting. Did you have anything to say? No. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, and this is the place where we start to feel like, hmm, this is getting pretty good. 
The mind is very, very still and very, very bright and very blissful. It's a very deep kind of bliss that we don't get to experience very often in our busy lives. You know, it's a, having a mind that is so sharp and so still is extremely blissful. So when one meditates in this way, one's awareness and perception becomes invaded and filled with endless consciousness. So sometimes the, the real can start again and little bits of consciousness kind of start kicking in again and you have a bit of a movie going on. But and more, more and more the mind will see that and will know that trick of the mind and will be like, nah, no, nah, I'm just better without the movie and without the, the real and the little images and the thinking and much better to go back into the stillness and so release and relaxing back into the still mind basically. So this is seen as a disturbance now as wisdom gets deeper, discernment gets deeper. Hmm. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. And slowly you can see that we're getting somewhere interesting. Starting, it's starting to sound like Nibbana would start to sound to me anyways. <laughs> um, slowly, slowly. Dire, dire. Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. All right. I like where this is going. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, leaving behind the plane of bare awareness. Hmm, what's after that? One understands and abides in the plane between awareness and its limit. So this is also called neither perception nor non-perception. Neva sanya asanya. And this is a bit of a, like a marsh. It's a little bit of a gray zone where uh, we release the mind so much that the experience of the, just like the awareness of awareness itself uh, or nothingness that also will fade away and then you might be wondering well what's what's after that well that's the whole point is that <laughs> we are starting starting to realize that even this awareness is fabricated so it arises and passes away. Uh, even if the movie, like even if the real is not there anymore, we start to notice that this light of awareness also is arising and passing away, basically very, very quickly. And it is fully fabricated. The, the projector, the projector of our mind, the projector of, of awareness, it needs an object. Awareness needs an object all the time to be aware. I mean, otherwise it cannot be aware. And the last object is itself, basically. And that is the last, the final frontier of I. Because the last of the aggregate that constitute what I think is me is that awareness. This is the subtlest level of perception, basically. And the last bastion of this ego or this I-ness, I my-ness, is, is this awareness. And as we move into neither perception or non-perception, now the mind is very, very still. It's not moving. It's not moving at all. And it's, it's not still because you're forcing it it's still because you cultivated discernment and wisdom and let go of any mental movements and distractions and hindrances that it became still. If you were to just like make it still and force it like that, it wouldn't be the same thing. 
that's not the way that we can access this state. This state can only be accessed through wisdom and letting go of everything else. And usually this will happen for people on the first retreat, their first retreat or you know, uh, beginning the path after probably, I would say, two to three hours of sitting meditation. Yes? No? Okay. <laughs> there was like a... Ooh. <laughs> now, this is okay. It's, it's okay. And that's why we, uh, we encourage people to sit in chairs, to sit comfortably. Um, I know we're, we're, we don't have a, a big amount of chairs here, but... Uh, uh, this is really important that we are allowing our minds to be to calm down for this amount of time uh, because the mind it, it just takes time to reach that place there's no magic there's no you know special pill you can swallow and then boom you're there it doesn't it doesn't really work like that and the longer you can sit uh, the, the more time the mind will have to settle down and to you, you will allow your mind to really have the causes and conditions to experience this state. Okay, so now we have this clear, you know, this clear beam, of that projector that is just like not projecting anything but just like this light of awareness basically. And uh, as we deepen our understanding, we, we understand that this too is fabricated, this too arises through causes and conditions, and it's like micro, basically, micro uh, consciousness. What happens here is that this is the deepest uh, part of dependent origination, uh, where we have sankharas, or mental activities, generating consciousness. And that's what that is. And when sankharas are completely calmed down, the arising of consciousness cannot be anymore. So there is a blowing out of consciousness as well when the activities of the mind are completely gone. Neither perception and non-perception is where the clarity of the mind will be so bright it just kind of disappears. And the Buddha said this is where it starts to be a little tricky because when there's no awareness, how do we know anything? <laughs> how do we know we were in that state? So the Buddha says you're only going to be aware of that when you come out, basically. So you're going to go into dips of release and releasing awareness, basically, and then it's going to go like, it's, it's going to come back online, and then you'll be like, oh, right. There was like a bit there that I wasn't really, like there was, there was nothing really happening. There, I wasn't there anymore, basically. So Bhante would say it's like falling asleep but being aware at the same time. It's, and even saying that is a little tricky because uh, these words are, uh, can be misleading but gives you a little bit of an idea. There's like this release of kind of like falling asleep and letting everything go but there's still there, it, it's more sharp than just falling asleep. So there's that quality of clear awareness there. This is that other kind of happiness which is beyond and more exalted. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception becomes invaded and filled with uh, bare awareness, the movie projector. And one feels it as a disturbance. In this way, in, by this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbāna is happiness. Ānanda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Hmm. Okay. Because, Ānanda, there is another kind of happiness, beyond and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, leaving behind the plane between awareness and its limit, neither perception nor non-perception, one understands and abides in the release from perceptual awareness or experiential awareness. 
This is Sanya Vedayitta Niroda. This is that other kind of happiness which is beyond and more exalted. And now as you, we get uh, accustomed or habituated to that kind of uh, marshy grounds where we're releasing awareness but it's not fully gone yet there could, because there's like, uh, levels of this uh, awareness kind of dissipates and it dissolves into something that it, we are not, we're barely aware of and then it comes back in and then we can see, oh, there is like very little mental activities there. It's almost like it disappeared. And then at some point, as we really get to stay with that experience, and maybe that's going to be usually a solid three to four hour sit, then the mind will take its full dive, a full dip into complete cessation of mental activities. And... Um, this is what we read every morning, and that's, this is why we read it. This is peaceful, this is sublime, namely the stilling of all processes, the stilling of all sankara, basically. Breaking free from all mental limitations, the complete calming of tension, appeasement release, the blowing out. And so, when all mental activities are completely released, then there is, uh, the lights go out basically. And there is no more awareness, there is no more experience, and the mind is uh, completely released. But when, uh, when a person experiences this, in a way of speaking, because now words are kind of tricky, but <laughs> um, there is no experience in that state. There is only experience of it coming out. And coming out of it, there will be noticing how the mind uh, basically is rebooting, like uh, restarting a computer, like these old computers. The old computers work better for the analogy because now it's just like a kind of streamlined, like pew. But before it, you could hear it like kind of starting a and then it would do all kind of crazy sounds and, yeah, and then it would pop in. So the mind is kind of noticing itself like kind of coming up, coming up, coming back online and the first contact that will be experienced is uh, contact with uh, signlessness, voidness, and undirected. So this is as close to the experience of Nibbana that one can experience, basically. Because the mind was completely released, one experiences signless. There was not an object anymore. There was no awareness at all, zero. It was just completely released. Then there was voidness, the I was gone. There's nothing to say like, oh, I saw this or I saw that I. And uh, when consciousness arises again, it sees like, yes, this was completely void of a self. And then the undirected was that, uh, is that, one will see that there was no more direction in the mind. It was completely open. It was completely free. And so there was not, uh, uh, there was no clinging, there was no uh, holding on to any experience, it was completely released, completely open. And a lot of joy arises. And this kind of joy can stay for quite a while, um, it can stay for a day or two. And it doesn't really go away, it's just that we get used to it um, and it, it becomes a, a little bit the, the default background uh, operating system of the mind uh, with release basically. The mind at this point will, um, it's like the, we've reprogrammed the operating system in the mind and now it's uh, on constant release basically. So whatever happens 
um, of course we can get caught up into things and emotions and you know upheavals and things like that but mostly uh, there will be an understanding that the release is better and we will know the whole of the path basically all the way till the end there's still work to be done there's still uh, meditation and uh, hindrances to release because the mind has been programmed for a long time a condition for a long time in this way but now a person knows the entire path all the way till the end even though they're not an arhat or a fully awakened person they know how to get there and they know the whole way and so a lot of tremendous confidence in the buddha well first in the dhamma because they see they know the eightfold path they know the path they know the dhamma the middle way and that means well, obviously, that's what the Buddha taught, so the confidence in the Buddha is uh, also coming along with that. And confidence in the Sangha, basically. And Sangha here means any of the awakened people. And that means, that doesn't mean somebody who's wearing a robe, that means somebody who's understood the Dhamma and is practicing in line with the Dhamma, basically. That can be anybody in this room. And so whoever is practicing in line with this Dhamma that this person has just seen this whole path, well then obviously uh, confidence that they, they are practicing properly, basically. That's, that's what that means. And also the virtues. One will, when one understands uh, to that level uh, this meditation, the virtues become so essential. They, they're like obviously... Um, like obvious limits that someone cannot cross anymore because that would just like create such uh, havoc, havoc in the mind to go beyond these limits. And so it's just the natural thing that people will naturally stay, happily stay within these limits as a protection. And so this, the unwavering confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and the virtues, these are called the four factors of stream entry, which means uh, sotapatti. Uh, that person um, has tasted and experienced the Dhamma, and they are on their way to full awakening, basically. And their mind... Uh, lean slants and slopes towards release nibbana so there's a question Yes. Yes. So basically, I just said it, the four factors of stream entry. Yes. That is doubt. Doubt is gone because the unwavering confidence is there in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and virtue. Then doubt is no more possible. So that's, that's one of them. Then the false belief in the personal self, Sakkaya Ditti. Then that comes about because somebody sees that awareness itself is fully fabricated by that. That's what it means like sankara pachaya vinyana. Uh, the sankaras make up consciousness. Basically, we think that consciousness is experiencing activities within it, and that consciousness is eternal. But the Buddha says this is wrong view, and the Buddha basically gave us dependent origination and he says actually sankaras create consciousness consciousness cannot arise without mental activities and i give the analogy of um, the murmuration of the starlings where you have all these little birds have you ever seen them flying around and they make this kind of cloud and uh, so basically this is this is kind of what this consciousness is it looks like a thing, <laughs> looks like a cloud, but it's a bazillion little birds flying all over the place. And these are the sankharas. And that cloud 
it, it's like the illusion is that it's, it's a thing, but it's just made up. And the more we relax, we release the mind, the less birds there are to move around. And then at some point, they're like completely dissipated. And then we realize, ah, oh, this is uh, completely conditioned, completely fabricated. And so there is no, the self, even though you're not a Narahant yet, because the mana, mana is conceit, pride. And that's one of the fetters that is given up in Arahantship, basically, when a person is fully awakened. That's not there yet. But the Sakaya Ditti is the understanding that a personal self cannot be. Basically, that's what it is. Like, you're still going to get uh, angry or impatient. You're still going to have uh, sensual desires for things. But in the back of your mind, you will know that the self is, like, a self is not possible. It's completely crafted, fabricated. So that's the Sakaya Ditti. And then uh, sila bhatta paramasa, the blind, uh, like adherence to rites and rituals leading to liberation is uh, no longer possible because you have seen through the Eightfold Path, right effort, uh, wise practice, wise awareness, and wise meditation, all the eight jhanas that we just talked about, the sequence, the very clear sequence that one sees all the way to Niroda, this is the way, this is the path. And then, you know, uh, uh, like any kind of blind rituals or um, observances that one could do to kind of, uh, you know, oh, may I reach Nibbana, may I reach Nibbana. It's not going to happen like that. <laughs> I mean, of course, if you have the wish, that's one thing that will bring you closer, for sure. <laughs> but it's not going to happen just like by rites and rituals, basically. So by this very specific practice, right effort, all the way up to the jhanas. The jhanas are basically the role map of the mind, of the liberation. And so these are the three, um, uh, the three fetters that are set to be given up at stream entry. Uh, to recap, doubt, uh, per uh, personal self, b the belief in a personal self, and then uh, rites and rituals leading to liberation. What I explained is stream entry. So basically, whenever there is no more doubt, because there is complete unwavering faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and the virtue, uh, when, when doubt is gone, when blind adherence to rites and rituals is gone, like through wisdom, through understanding of the Dhamma. And then when someone can no longer see that be, having a, per, like a, a self is possible, then, then that is stream entry. Regardless of jhana, this can, this, can be, this can happen pretty much, not any time, but in many different ways. But this will be a very, you know, this is a very like solid entire path. Like this is the whole recipe basically. It can happen and it also we have to say that there is a path and a fruition to these attainments. So somebody can be, you know, at a place where they have entered the stream, but they're not firmly settled in there. So their faith is really strong, but it still can be, you know, shaken a little bit. So they're not fully there yet. They're not, they're not in the fruition. Let's finish this. And having seen with discernment, mental distractions are completely brought to an end. So when there's no more mental activities, obviously there's no more distractions. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. And of course, uh, some people sometimes get scared, by the way, of this experience because they think... Uh, like, uh, they're, like everything's going to be different and uh, they're like going to be like arahants who don't care about anybody or like <laughs> 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 whatever that means, which, which is really far from the reality. Um, and they, they think, oh, and some people think they're, they're going to get stuck in there. Like I'm never going to come out of Naroda or whatever, like that like place where everything stops. 
Actually, entering Naroda is pretty hard in itself. It takes a lot of devotion and wisdom and to stay in there, to, just to attain it in the first place, but to stay in there is even more. So what, what's going to happen is, is what I call the, the kiss of Nibbana, basically. Uh, most likely what's going to happen is that a person will just like experience this like really quick, brief uh, kiss of Nibbana and they kind of right away come out. <laughs> because it's, just gonna, it's like a, a quick dip, basically. Uh, the mind lets go and then usually what will happen is like, oh, was that it? <laughs> or uh, something like that so there's gonna be like um, it's not easy to stay in there so don't worry you won't get stuck <laughs> it's a it would be a quite amazing feat to get stuck in there so don't worry um, and it's only it's only a very beautiful blissful experience and yeah uh, Everything else after seems like um, uh, like the Buddha will say say here. Then the Venerable Sariputta exclaimed to the monks, Nibbana is blissful, friends, Nibbana is blissful. When this was said, the Venerable Udayi said, What is the reason why, friend Sariputta, it is said to be blissful when there is nothing to be felt in there? <laughs> That is exactly why it is blissful, friend. <laughs> because there is nothing to be felt. Uh, and this is a really interesting uh, understanding uh, that we do not get very often in this world. But uh, yeah, the end of having a break from all the sensory input is so blissful. Uh, and this is where we can really taste that with our mind. Because of this, Ananda, those practitioners of other teachings might ask, the sage Gotama speaks of the end of perceptual awareness and declares it as partaking of happiness. How can this be? How can this be said? When this is asked, Ananda, the wanderers of other teachings should be answered in this way. Friend, the awakened one does not declare only pleasant sensations as partaking of happiness. Friend, in that way, wherever one goes, happiness is found. Whether here or there, this the truth finder, the Tathagata, the Buddha, declares as true happiness. So in a mind that is liberated to that extent, it's very easy to be happy all the time for no reason. You don't need anything and you can just sit there and bliss out for four hours <laughs> and you're going to come out bright and shiny and it didn't cost you anything. You had nothing to do with anything else. And then you're just going to be a really happy person and influence everybody around you to be happy and it's great. <laughs> And so this is what happens and then it just, it just pours out of you and it's uh, the best life warranty that you can have, the best happiness, the best, the wisest investment you can make in your life and to share that with others. When I left Damasuka to be a wandering uh, solitary forest monk in Canada, uh, I wrote a poem for Bhante. Would you like to hear it or should I just call it? Yes, okay. So, <clears throat> yes, so this is the last thing basically that I, I, I read to, to Bhante before I left. And the, I called it the forest elder. When there is a clear cut, Reverend said, they leave an elder standing, not laid. To show the way, shelter and sway, for the young to grow from the seeds he sowed. For the elder is wise, many seasons in his eyes. Now he takes all the blows, the four winds bend him low. But he stands still, not shaken nor dismayed. In his heart, love is filled 
for he knows the true way. In an era laid bare, the seekers find a pair. Up this mighty trunk stare, a mind of heartwood shattering despair. A tamed lion in the savanna, a noble friend in samsara, an elder of the dhamma, grandfather of the sangha. May many find their way under his shelter and sway, ardent and resolute they break free and homage pay, sheltering him in return from the four winds taking turns, oasis for the shadeless, a virtuous, loving forest. Thank you. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, Share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sigh.